Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivis, and um, today we're going to talk about an interesting topic, something you've probably never heard about in any of the ketogenic spaces. Love to know some who's talking about it out there. But today we're going to talk about the liver. Yeah, the liver. Nobody talks about the liver. Of course, everybody talks about the liver, but I'm going to talk about a specific aspect of the liver. And what we're going to talk about today is two things. First and foremost, let's talk about hormones of the liver. Everybody talks about the pancreas and insulin and glucagon. Nobody ever talks about the hormones that the liver itself actually makes. The liver, yes, of course, it's superb about storing and processing and releasing different hormones um, and using them up and repurposing them and releasing them. So, But the liver has never really been seen as a significant producer of hormones that have a metabolic influence. And liver health, which is really the, the, the topic of this talk, liver health, is so, so important. And we're going to address two components of liver health. The first component is one you've probably never heard of. And those are the hormones that the liver itself synthesizes and secretes. And there are four very important hormones that we already know about, but we've minimized because we haven't understood them in great detail or really haven't been able to synthesize them and capitalize on them as a drug. So the big popular drug is GLP-1, which is made by the gut. Everybody's on it now. Everybody's using it. But there are four very, very important beneficial hormones made by the liver and really made by a healthy liver, a damaged, a fatty liver, a, uh, a liver with steatohepatitis, fatty liver disease is not going to function adequately. And I'll explain to you why in the second half. But the first hormone that is made by the liver, and it's got an old name, a new name, what I grew up knowing it as, and we didn't really know what it did, is something called somatomedin. Somatomedin, it's an incretin in the same class as GLP-1 and those other popular hormones. But it's called now insulin-like growth factor number one. Think about that. Insulin-like growth factor number one. And this is an amino acid. It's a, it's a protein hormone. And it is not growth hormone. It is not growth hormone. Growth hormone comes from the pituitary gland in the brain. But IGF-1 is the immediate stimulus for growth of the body. More powerful for all those athletes out there than human growth hormone, than HGH. Growth hormone, which is released from the anterior pituitary, binds to receptors. So here's how growth hormone works. All, the, all those, those big muscle bulking people, but we use growth hormone um, for short stature. We use growth hormone uh, for bodybuilding. We use it for repair of injury after burns, that kind of thing. Human growth hormone is a tremendously powerful, well-known, everybody knows HGH. And the Olympic Committee, oh, it's so bad, you can't. Think about this, folks. I didn't even know. It'll be interesting if any of you out there research this, whether or not IGF-1 is a banned substance with the Olympic Committee. I'd be interested in that. So let me know. Leave a comment. But human growth hormone, which is released from the anterior pituitary, binds to receptors on the surface of liver cells, on the surface of hepatocytes. And HGH, human growth hormone, stimulates the synthesis, the production and release of igf from your liver cells. And it's IGF, insulin-like growth factor number one, that is active at a cellular level everywhere in the body because most of the body cells have receptors for IGF, especially the cells of bone marrow, of cartilage, of muscles, of growing long bones. IGF is the important growth factor. And the binding of IGF to cells with receptors for it, stimulates them to move from a dormant cell cycle to an active cell cycle, where the cells are growing, the cells are dividing, the cells are growing. So IGF-1 is the trigger for cellular division, for cellular growth. Bones, cartilages, muscle, re tissue repair, tissue regeneration. And if you're that bodybuilder out there, if you're that person that's been tremendously traumatized, if you are that recovering diabetic, recovering from neuropathy, and you've corrected your blood sugars, 
and you are insulin sensitive, IGF is your friend. And the liver makes IGF. So it behooves you to have a healthy liver. Then the HGH that your brain works is going to work in that liver, is going to trigger health. And that is one of the other very important pathways that we're just trying to learn about in terms of cancer surveillance. Growing new cells and preventing and reducing the risk of cancer together with insulin itself. So IGF, you're going to be hearing about it tremendously over the next 10 years as the pharmaceutical industry begins to develop this drug. And it's a, it's a protein. They can synthesize, blah, synthesize it. They can make it in the laboratory. You're going to hear about it. But you heard about it here <laughs> first. Okay. Um, second, and, and remember, IGF-1 is different from IGF-2 receptors. And, and it's a different drug. We're not going to go into IG, uh, IGF-2 uh, right now. But that is a longevity uh, um, a longevity uh, um, molecule. So um, the level of IGF-1 in the blood is highest during puberty, which is, of course, the time of rapid growth. And occasionally, children with stunted growth don't have adequate, they've got liver disease, they don't have adequate IGF. So think about this, folks. All those kids are eating tons of carbohydrates. And carbohydrates cause a fatty liver and affect the production of IGF by those damaged hepatocytes. It's affecting their growth. It's affecting their tissue repair. It's affecting every cell in their body in a negative way. Blows your mind. That's why liver health, that's why not having a fatty liver and a fatty liver is a direct consequence of carbohydrate uh, consumption. Not having a fatty liver is so important because of IGF. And recombinant human IGF-1 is now available. It is available as a drug. Nobody's heard of it, so nobody's really using it. It's used in people who have abnormal human growth hormone or human growth hormone receptor because remember, HGH triggers IGF. So in those stunted growth people who have human growth hormone genetic abnormalities, they can use IGF, recombinant IGF. IGF is available. And I, as the carb addiction doctor, am going to state categorically right now that for tissue repair, for injury, for cancer recovery, for recovery from diabetes, neuropathies, from re for recovery, recovery, recovery of damage to your body, IGF-1 to my mind, should be available, should be studied, but should be available to people recovering from trauma. But only, 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 only in the face of not having a fatty liver, being on a ketogenic diet, and having corrected fatty liver disease, which comes from chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. Okay, now the second hormone that gets produced by the liver is something called angiotensinogen. Angiotensin is the active component. This is a protein that gets released into the bloodstream and serves as the precursor, angiotensinogen, for angiotensin. What does angiotensin do? And there was a huge uh, big deal about angiotensin when it was first discovered. VEGF1 um, and angiotensin, discovered by a physician at Harvard, who I think went on to win the, the Nobel Prize. Hey folks, that's my CGM. What's it telling me? Oh, blood sugar at 65. My Dexcom G7 is screaming at me. Guys, it's okay. I'm fine. I'm having a chat with you. Okay? That's called insulin sensitivity. Blood sugar 65. CGM working. Anyway, just a segue. Let's talk about angiotensin. So, uh, there was a huge amount uh, done with angiotensin and vascular uh, uh, growth. That's actually where the whole prostaglandin, the Viagra, the Cialis, all of those things came around the same time, about 20 or 30 years ago, when angiotensin was discovered. And angiotensin has a very, very important role in blood pressure and blood pressure control, working together with the kidneys, new blood vessel growth, and blood pressure, blood, uh, uh, blood vessel diameter, control of blood pressure. And it works together with salt, 
but it's produced by a healthy liver. So for all of those guys out there, all of you with high blood pressure and you're on all these blood pressure medications, how healthy is your liver? How healthy is your liver? How good is your liver at producing angiotensinogen? And how important is it not that you're on a low carbohydrate, high salt diet to help your liver to be as healthy as it can be to help to control your blood pressure? Everyone thinks of blood pressure in terms of kidneys and heart and lungs. Well, let's add the liver to that mix. Angiotensin, hormone produced by the liver. The next biggie is TPO, thrombopoietin. What's thrombopoietin? Again, it's a protein amino acid chain which stimulates precursor cells in the bone marrow to become platelets. Platelets, megakaryocytes, which are essential to blood clotting. So the liver produces a hormone that produces platelets. And we know in a healthy clotting system, platelets are vitally important. And new platelets, platelets are for about 10 days at any one time, but they get used up much quicker if you're in a procoagulant environment. So thrombopoietin is very, very important. Ask anybody who's got chronic uh, uh, kidney failure how important their platelet count is. And if you've got liver failure, if you've got liver cirrhosis, liver damage, liver fibrosis, your thrombopoietin, your TPO is going to be low. You're not going to be producing platelets. And you're going to be chewing up those platelets very, very quickly in the spleen. So a healthy liver produces healthy TPO. And those platelets are under homeostatic control. So how does that work? Well, the megakaryocytes are in your bone marrow. They're the precursors. Those are the big cells that, that produce platelets. But there are very few of them. So when platelet counts are high, the TPO is bound to the platelets and less is, pre and less is available to get the megakaryocytes to produce, to produce uh, platelets. So it's a feedback system. Platelets bind TPO, so the more platelets there are, the, and the more you're destroying uh, platelets, the lower your TPO results are, the less platelets you produce. When your platelet, le platelet levels dip down, your liver produces TPO, you increase your platelet count. Everything in the human body is cyclical like that. But if you've got a broken liver, none of that matters. None of that matters. And we're producing about... Oh God, I can't, I'm, I'm terrible at math. 10 to the 11th power, 10 to the 11th power of platelets every day under normal conditions. And even just a slight drop in that, that's how important platelets are. So your TPO is very, very important. The next, the next hormone that the liver produces is one I've not even heard of. I'd never heard of it. It's called hepcidin, H-E-P-C-I-D-I-N. And hepcidin is an amino acid, again, it's a protein, that blocks the release of iron from intracellular stores in the body. Where's iron stored? It's stored with ferritin in the cells. Ferritin is an intracellular molecule that binds iron. And you don't want iron released under unnecessary circumstances into the bloodstream. But you want it available. And hepcidin regulates the release of iron from intracellular stores in all of the cells, which maintains homeostatic levels of iron in the body fluids, which helps with hemoglobin production, and is a defense. Iron is a very important defense against invasion of pathogenic bacteria. Think COVID. Oh my God, my CGM won't let me go. Let's see what it is now. Up oh, 63 and going down. And guess what, folks? That's called normal. Don't worry about me. I'm in ketosis. Blood sugar of 63. There it is. <laughs> All good. So it's just noisy. So hepcidin is very important to control iron, and iron will control hemoglobin levels, but also iron protects against the invasion of pathogenic bacteria. And when people's ferritin was very high in the COVID era, we would automatically admit them to the hospital just based on a high ferritin and a positive COVID test because they were predicted to have a bad outcome because they couldn't fight the pathogen. Low ferritin, healthy hepcidin, very good against COVID and other pathogens which require a substantial amount of iron for their virulence. So if you, if you block that iron available to those molecules, th those, those parasites, they don't breed viruses, bacteria. And the release of hepcidin in response to infection starves 
those pathogens from their need for iron. So hepcidin is an antimicrobial peptide and part of the innate immune system. Wow, just blows your mind. That's what the liver does, folks. That's what the, and we didn't even know that about iron. So when I do, I routinely on your blood work, I look at your iron numbers and I look at your ferritin, I look at your iron binding capacity. I look at those numbers. Not just in terms of hemoglobin, but in terms of your ability to fight infection and cancer. The fourth hormone, beta trophin or beta trophin. Again, it's another amino acid protein molecule that stimulates the proliferation of the insulin secreting beta cells of the pancreas. Hello. So the liver secretes a hormone, beta trophin, that causes the beta cells of the pancreas that produce insulin to multiply. So yes, number one, the beta cell mass is not a fixed cellular mass. It can grow, and we know it's gone in type 1 diabetes. And possibly in prolonged type 2 diabetes, there's a failure of beta trophin, but the, at least there's a failure of, of insulin. But everyone says, oh, your insulin cells are burned out. No, they're not burned out. You've got a shitty liver. You've got a fatty liver. Your beta trophin is being produced, and you cannot recover your beta cell mass. So if you have type 2 diabetes and you're on a low carbohydrate diet and you're trying to recover, get your damn liver into shape. Because it produces beta trophin that may get your beta cell mass, your insulin producing cell mass in your pancreas to grow, to multiply, to be able to produce more insulin. See how this works, folks? So perhaps, think about this for the pharmaceutical industry, perhaps injections of beta trophin made by recombinant DNA in pharmaceutical com by pharmaceutical companies, we've got that technology, maybe that can be a useful treatment for those people who still have a few beta cells left, either type 1 diabetics who still have a small amount of insulin production capacity, small volume of beta cells, most of them it's gone, they've got none, but if there's a little bit, especially early on, especially in young kids, or if you're a type 2 diabetic that's had it for a long time, that's in recovery mode and your liver is good, maybe that's a place where we can intervene. This is a whole new frontier, folks. You heard it here for the first time. Think about the hormones of the liver. I am the carb addiction doc. If you want to know more and you want to set up a consult, give me a shout because we look at liver health all the time. In fact, folks, right here, my folder of livers. If you look at this folder, it's all livers, it's all livers, it's all livers, livers, livers. Because that's what I do. Okay? That's what we do. And we look at healthy livers and we look at sick livers every single day in the operating room. And we can tell the difference between a good healthy liver and a crappy liver. And we can look at your blood work, we can look at your liver and help you with your liver health. I am the carb addiction doc. Treat your fatty liver. Get your liver doing some push-ups. Protect it. It is the most important organ in the human body. It defines us, together with our brains. Till next time.